Hello and welcome. It's another engaging episode of Community Report. I am Dari Ito. On the program today, we are taking you on a ride to Badagri, an area of Lagos known as the cradle of Western civilization. But the journey is a different one this time around. Badagri is one of the key social cultural places in Nigeria. And one of the ways to tell the story of this unique place is through the museums, the monuments, without forgetting to savour the coastal nature of the community. How are things changing in a couple of years? What is the nature of the heritage sites there? Are there other places of attraction in the Asian community? This episode provides some answers. Bright and early, we are setting out at Falomo Jetty. But first, a quick chat with the men that will pilot the boat from here to Badagri on the estimated time of arrival, the safety of the boat, and what to expect. Uh, we are taking off from Falomo Jetty uh, straight to Badagri. From what we gathered, it's going to take an hour. And what we're doing is just to uh, make sure that we make people connect more with history. But that really holds a special place in history uh, because of the slave trade activities that went on there. And it's not just uh, relevant to Nigeria, it's across the African continent. And in, this, in the course of this program, we would be taking you through a journey of the heritage site situated in Badagri. We are up on the boat and ready to go. And as we travel along the waterways through the back end of the city, the commercial nature of Lagos reveals itself even more. Travel is a viable alternative, especially if you're going to a place like Badagri where there's a lot of road construction and traffic gridlock on the way. But water travel doesn't come cheap. Nonetheless, you can cut a lot of travel time if you travel using this alternative. Lagos is a network of lagoons, lakes and streams. Movement across these heritage sites may require water travel. After travelling for an hour or thereabout, we arrived at Badagri. This is Idale. The place has its own unique history and our first stop is the palace of the traditional ruler there. Badagri covers many parts. Though we have colonies and small towns, Badagri is still the umbrella name, even up to Seme. From what we gathered from history, Badagri covered up to Boundary. That is why the place is named Boundary. But as time went by, things changed and more people joined us, including the Awaris. Many people have joined us, including the Yorubas. We cannot drive anyone. They are now indigents. We are thankful for the establishment of ASCON. Those who worked with ASCON then lived here and stayed back. They bought land build houses, and that even made the community grow bigger. For these traders, there's a keno available to take them to the neighboring community for trading. And it takes just one of them to have that information, then she signals the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Woo! In 
They travel along the creek where the beautiful tall palm trees cohabit, providing canopy for the animals and other natural habitats of the humid environment. You see where you are, it's very, very historical. Hundreds of years ago, now we are at Idale, okay, in Badagri area. Hundreds of years ago, the same way the boats, okay, uh, taking the women to the other side of this swamp, was the same way the ancestors around here used to walk, but not with a the boat. They remove all their clothes, okay, just with maybe the pants or boxers or whatever they have to cover their private part. But of course, some people won't have anything to cover their part. So they remove all their clothes around here where we are standing and they put all the clothes on their head and their bags and they walk through this water, this same path, and they walk through to get to where they're going to. So when they get to the other side, they now dress up to wherever they are going to. So what we are seeing today is very historical and people need to even know about it. It's great. So now, where are these women going? Where are they going now? They are going to the other side. It's not very far. Now, the, instead of, like today, we have a major road, which is farther. But here is just like the shortest cut, not a shortcut, the shortest cut. So if you take a car, if, you, if you're in your car, going so to where they are going now, yeah. probably they, they, will, they will have done whatever transaction they want to go and do, and they are back, and you are still in the car or in the bus. From Idale, we moved to Topo Island, and it's another boat journey. Many years ago, the Catholics, this was where they established the first teachers training college and even the military after the Catholic left the military had their settlements here when we get there you'll be so surprised of the ruins well they call the call, call well, the structures we will find here ruins but you'll be so surprised we have things like this here in Baragui. Right. therefore it's a choice, so I don't want to take it. Hey, this island is called the seedbed of faith in Nigeria. The journey started for the missionaries here in the 1870s. Topo Island, you call it Topo Island or Topo Peninsula. Because during the Christianity era, the missionaries, the Catholic came here for the missionaries and the third missionaries that came to Badagri. And they came with some items, which is a, a Western education, elementary science, and some and agricultural science. So they came here, they gave them farms here, and they leased the land for 99 years. After 99 years, they left, then the government took it up again. Well, all these buildings are still standing, were owned by the Catholic missionaries. And we have their burial ground there. So we have their burial ground there, where they have been buried. So this is the house of the school masters. So this is the house of the school masters. You can see. We have the church there. We have another school masters house there. We have their lodge there. We even have their jetty that are used there. We also have the even they have generator they use there. So everything is on the island here. So their cemetery where they buried all the Reverend Fathers were there. After touring the island, we are back to another community. Everybody can come and 
Mobi family. And behind me, we have a museum there called Mobi Slave Relics Museum. And uh, when, when we get into the museum, we'll find some artifacts of slave heritage, relics of slave history. We have them in there. We have, this is part of the instrument for the lip lock, okay? Now, what did they do with this? Unfortunately, many years ago, you could actually unscrew this part of this instrument. And they forced the wrist of a slave in here. So as soon as the wrist gets inside this circle, Okay, now, imagine there's a platform here. Maybe a table, this may be a chair. So someone will climb the table or the chair, okay? And they will first tie this, they, okay, they screw it on a tree. The slave they want to torture or punish, they make the slave to also climb the platform, maybe a chair or a table, okay? And while that person is on that platform, they force the wrist into this metal. So when they do that, don't forget that this is, this is already on the tree, it's been screwed to a tree. So when they do that, they remove the platform underneath the feet of the slaves. So when they do that, so the weight of the body will be on the wrist. So the slaves is dangling. And most times when they do that, they do that in the presence of other enslaved persons. The reason why they usually do that was to put fear in their hearts, to let them know that if they commit the same offense that particular slave had committed, that's the same punishment. It was actually to put fear. They were dealing with them psychologically. This is just one. No matter what I try to tell you about the experience of the ancestors, it's, it's not even half of what they went through. We have slave children too. Chain for children looks like this. Now, what you're looking at was part of the instrument for the lip lock. We have different type of lip locks, okay? There's a particular one that they pierce the upper and lower lips, and they put a lock on the lips. Just the way you lock your gate, they lock the lips of human beings. Okay, there's one called the iron muzzle. The iron muzzle uh, is like a mini mask, and has a padlock at the back of the head, connected to the chain around the slave's neck, okay? But you see, the one I'm holding, when they put this on the lips, they draw the lips out, and they put the padlock on, on, on it. Now, this, these are called, these are the neck locks. I need someone to, that we can, for the neck. Okay. Oh, this is heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> now, the unfortunate part of it is that they don't just put it around their neck, on the neck of the enslaved persons like this. They also put the padlock. They, they lock it from here. Now, just imagine, sir, you're putting this on. Imagine it's 400 years ago and you've not even eaten maybe for two days. Now, this moment, can you just tell us what you think our ancestors went through? Pain. Pain. So you mean you have pain, you have pains around your neck right now? Yes, and it's heavy. It is, it is heavy. Okay, I see that's why you are holding it, yeah. to prevent the weight. The they may not understand what you are going through, but it was a very terrible time. And the ancestors are chained together on a single fire. They are chained together on a single fire. So a neck lock, a chain, okay, a single chain like this may have maybe 15 neck locks, may have maybe 20 neck locks or more. Because when they get to the point of no return, they all walk on the slave route on a single fire. The chain, of course, the neck lock is already on their neck. The chain, the hands, the ankle. And while walking on the slave route, they drag their feet, and there's usually someone behind them with the horse whip. They dealt with them psychologically.
The Serikia Bar Slave Barracoon is a cell built by Brazilian slave merchants in 1840. Since it's a walking distance from the Moby Museum, we made a stop there. Yeah, but Agri has a lot of heritage sites, as you can know. Uh, let me start with the history of uh, Christianity. Like uh, the site of Agiatri, that is where Christianity was first preached in uh, September 1842. <laughs> but before Christianity, Agiatri was a significant tree. It's a, a huge tree at the square of the city, Badagri. Under the tree, a lot of activity took place. Like the, under the umbrella of the tree, they also used the tree as a market square. So when the uh, first set of missionaries visited Badagri, they used under the umbrella tree of Agia tree to preach the first sermon in Nigeria. That's 1842. That is where Christianity started. Uh, we also have the old slave port in Badagri. Uh, we also have the four-story building. The four-story building in Nigeria was built by Reverend Goma in 1845. Yes. And uh, inside the first-story building, that is where uh, late Bishop Samuel Adjai Crowder translated the English Bible to Yoruba language. Uh, opposite the four-story building, or opposite the slave port, we have the uh, joining to the uh, uh, joining to point of no return through the Berefu Peninsula, the slave in chain shackles on their leg. They will walk for about 15 minutes before they get to the uh, the ocean front. That is where we call the point of no return today. The point of no return where a lot of African uh, descent people were, were carried away to the Caribbean, to the Americas, and uh, to Europe. There are many cultural wealth situated in Badagri. The traditional institutions are also custodians of the oral history. From palace to palace, there are variants of accounts of the roles each community or family played in history. Uh, 22nd of uh, uh, August, 1791, some of the slaves from Africa, they were taking them to, uh, to the Caribbean island. Precisely, I think the country was called Santo Domingo then. Now it's called Haiti because I was in the vanguard for some years that, you know, we are, we, there, there's a UNESCO declaration that is uh, International Day for Remembrance of Slave Trade and its Abolition. I used to champion that uh, Remembrance Day in Badagri, you know. Some of the slaves taken away from Africa, they were heading to that com community, Santo Domingo. And you know, citing the community and they said, where are we coming from? Something just ginger them and they kill all the slaves. I mean, they kill all the slaves master in that ship and they took possession of that island thing today. That island is called Haiti. All these stories started from Africa where Badagri, Daume, Aziz, because of a lot of the majority of the slaves settled in that as it's in Haiti, they are of Egun origin. Because till today, when you get to, to Haiti, they call fire Ozo, which is the same name with Badagri people, Ozo. They also have Sato. That Sato drum, Sato drum is a big drum of the Egun people. When you are entering to Badagri, you see Sato drum. It's part of our monument. And if you are not initiated to, this, uh, to, to the people who can drum that drum, you can just drum it. Whether you lost your father or you lost your mother, you have to, if you lost both, if you are an orphan, you use the two hands to hit Sato drum. Those are part of the historical, uh, cultural uh, heritage of Badagri people. Uh, 
with the help of the stakeholders, we, the first thing to do is to pencil down all the heritage sites. We have a lot of heritage sites, apart from the popular one. We have a lot of heritage sites scattered all over Badagri. Some company, they have heritage sites in their company, but they don't know. The public, they, they don't know of it. Mobi family, like my own family, I'm from the uh, Mobis of Badagri, the Super Mobis. You know, we have, we have relics of slave trade in that compound. Other families like that. Not only Mobi. Some people have these uh, relics. They have other things in their compound that they don't know the value of it. Well, before we can do anything that's worth our while, we must pull in all our stakeholders. And that's what we've done. That's a starting point, being able to identify who are the stakeholders, being able to identify who are involved, who are relevant, you know, in, in the process. And so we've been able to identify them. We are also going to go into training, capacity development. Um, it's the capacity that we develop that will enable us to put content in place. And that's why we have the likes of Wikipedia, you know, working alongside the locals that are the stakeholders, the, the mere fact that they're here is even a psychological um, amusement for everyone that is involved because they're able to, is already gingering them up to know that, you know, it's not going to be business as usual in Badagri, you know, some things are happening. Um, we're also showcasing them internationally and globally. Um, this is what all of these things is all about, being able to let the whole world know um, what's going on. And of course, when the whole world knows what's going on, traffic will come in. And when traffic starts coming in, the tourists are coming in from all over the place, we are also going to start having IGR. Economy will become more buoyant. We'll have employability. So all of those value chains, you know, there will be that effect all around the value chain. You know, the people that are into arts and crafts, they start selling, those are into fishery, all of the things that holds Badagri together, you know, so it's not just about the tourists coming, going to the heritage sites and all other tourism sites. It's also about them um, visiting all the merchandising sites that we have and being able to have takeaways, take something with them. Similarly, um, what we see as similarly intangible then becomes tangible when they start taking some of those replicated content items away with them. Before the, 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 the bad road, the state of the Badagri Express Road, we, we experienced a lot of tourists, even international tourists, they used to come to Badagri. But with the state of the road, nobody, no even investor that will come and invest in that such, of, uh, such a community that have bad road, you know. So I, I'm pleading to our government, though Lagos State Government, they are trying, but I'm still pleading to federal and uh, state government that they should do something about Badagri Road. Now they are working on it seriously, but uh, it's not enough. Then uh, power failure in Badagri is rampant. And the community that we want to promote tourism for international tourists or domestic tourism, we should have power all the time. Is that you come through the waterway? I came through the road to have another experience. In the past, I've been coming in through the water. And the cry out there is that the Badagri road is not suitable for tourists to come in. But to my own, with my experience today, I think I love to come on the road as well. Because the journey took me just two hours from the city of Power in Ikeja down to Badagri today. And I didn't face so much of traffic or challenge. Yes, there are bits of portals and the project, the construction is still ongoing. I can tell the public that at least I've witnessed it today. I came, I came here through the road and it wasn't as bad as what people made us to to believe and coming on the water too so you can either if you, have, if you don't have the phobia for water it's likely around an hour 10 minutes you will get to badagri from the falomo kauri so you can come in through the both sides and coming into badagri let me just start the with where we are we are presently at the lagos theater badagri and where a stakeholder meeting just held not long ago and to just discuss about the creating good content for people in this access so if a tourist come around we are ready to give them the best of tourism that we are, we are propelling to be giving the tourists and to be giving the people of Lagos. And from there, 
we just have by the side of this uh, Lagos Theatre Badagri, the Badagri Heritage Museum, which was just completed not long ago. And there you can have the history and the background of the slavery that took place in the 18th century and the abolition of the slave trade. You can get all the story and people that the way the Africans were being treated in the past. At this point, we are already losing sunlight. We cannot touch all the sites, but there's a choice to wrap up this expedition at a crucial point in history. We chose Berefu, an island close to the Atlantic Ocean. We walk staggeringly on the sandy road for another 20 minutes after covering a larger part of the journey on a bus. But when nearly 3 million slaves walked this part to the waiting ships, they were chained in their hands, on their legs and another metal clipped around their necks. Now at the main point, where palm trees stand guard around a structure erected, which now symbolizes a point of return, at least for tourists who can now go into the building, get a better view and return, unlike the slaves. As the name implies, the point of no return. During the slave trade era, once a slave made it to this point, there are no chances that they're coming back. And this is where we anchor the show for this week. If you miss any part of it, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. You can also follow the conversation on our social media platforms displayed on the screen. Thank you very much for watching. I am Dare Do. See you next time and bye for now.